Let's pray together and ask for his continuing help. Father, we have just sung with all sincerity that you would be the exclusive vision of our hearts. There's so many things that compete for the attention of our souls at this hour, and there are great concerns. They're legitimate concerns. Who here is not deeply concerned about the political climate, the economy, the global powers that are at work, and some in hostile, evil ways? Who here would not be concerned about family and community? Um, there are many, many things, Lord, that press our hearts at this moment. And yet we pray that you alone would occupy the expanse of our soul's vision. Fill up every part, every corner of it. Don't leave room for any of those other cares and concerns. Not that we would live life as if they didn't exist or, or in some kind of, of foolish naivete and oblivion. But, oh, Lord God, how we ask that our vision of you and your glory, of you and your great redeeming love would be so great that it would put every other care in its proper place. I ask that for those who are worn out on this day that you would provide physical strength and spiritual encouragement. May their minds be refreshed and renewed in the word. May their hearts be strengthened in the grace that is Jesus Christ. May you draw near to them and give them power uh, that they cannot manufacture on their own. For those whose hearts are filled with sorrow, we ask that you would be their comfort, that you would not just simply provide a word of comfort or, or a moment of relief from that sorrow, but that you would come to them in a very personal and intimate way and be the comfort of their sorrowing hearts. For those who feel confused by life and uncertain, would you come, Lord God, and be to them wisdom from on high? Clear up the confusion and uncertainty. Remove the doubts and establish your great dominion in their souls that they may live life with joy and hope and experience the fullness of your peace. And for those, Lord, who feel the, the dark grip of sin upon their souls, Deliver them on this day. Show them that there really is forgiveness for those sins. There really is deliverance from the slavery of that sin. There really is power to break those old enslaving habits and to establish new habits of grace. Give them that relief on this day. I pray, Lord God, that there would not be an enslaving power of sin lingering in any heart here. We ask that you would protect us from our adversary. As that other famous hymn of Martin Luther describes for us, his craft and power are great. He is armed with cruel hate. And while on earth there is no equal found to him, we praise you for our Savior because G Jesus is the mighty victor. And Satan is not even a close second to him. We ask that you would drive our adversary far from this assembly, that no worker of darkness would find an entrance to steal away the precious seed of the word or to distract us from the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Protect us, Lord. We are in need of your protection and we are in need of your guidance. And so I ask that as we open the word together, your Holy Spirit would be our instructor and guide that you would lead us into paths, uh, into green pastures and beside still waters for your name's sake, that you would lead us into paths of righteousness for your name's sake. These things we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, let's go to Romans 16, and we are coming near to the end. And I'm eager to preach today's message and then, Lord willing, wrap it up next week. Romans 16, if you're using one of the Bibles provided for you there, the seat rack in front of you, you'll find this on page 950, and I want to read verses 17 through 20 as we begin our sermon today. Romans 16, verse 17, I appeal to you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause divisions and create obstacles 
contrary to the doctrine that you have been taught, avoid them. For such persons do not serve our Lord, our Lord Christ, but their own appetites. And by smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the hearts of the naive. For your obedience is known to all, so that I rejoice over you. But I want you to be wise as to what is good and innocent as to what is evil. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. There are so many thoughts in this particular passage before us uh, today, and I want to categorize them into two broad headings, trying to make this simple and accessible. And it's clear from Paul's command to Rome that he's concerned about something happening, and so he calls them to be watchful. And there's a warning woven into this call to be watchful. Now, putting it in its context, it stands to reason, doesn't it, that as Jesus moves into people and he begins to transform them by the power of his forgiveness, the power of his justification, the power of this eternal life that we've been called into, that there's going to be spiritual opposition. And back in chapter 14, the key concept that Paul was driving home was welcome one another even as God has welcomed you. A diversity of opinions, a diversity of practices. There's room within Christ's church for a variety of those things, but one thing is clearly commanded, and that is that we be people who welcome one another. And then last week, we worked through a series of greetings, and I told you that that word greet, although it appears in a sense that we use it uh, day to day, and we'd say good morning to you, or we greet one another as we come into church, and we're showing consideration and affection and all that, it can also have the idea of embracing. And it's a parallel thought to what the welcoming really is. And as people of God, our love for one another, which grows out of God's love for us, and his love for others, we are continuing to see the importance of building that kind of relationship one with another that receives one another despite some of those significant personal differences and that is always looking to express the love of Christ. Those greetings are really significant. Now doesn't it stand to reason as God is creating this kind of atmosphere in his church, this kind of genuine bond of love and relationship that God's greatest adversary, Satan himself, would oppose it. And you better believe that he does. You better believe that Satan is alive and, as Peter describes, on the prowl, like a roaring lion, looking for those that he might devour. He's a destroyer. He's an accuser. He's a slanderer. He's a blasphemer. He is the wicked one. And we're going to touch on that a little later. Now, that's kind of the foundation underneath this warning, that there's real spiritual opposition that would come against God's people, and that sweet relationship that's growing where we really are loving one another, and the unity that flows out of it will be under attack. I'm also mindful that when Paul writes this letter, probably in the late 50s AD, he's already written a couple of key letters that we have in the New Testament. One of those is Galatians. The other is 1 Corinthians, maybe even 2 Corinthians, written by this particular time. Paul's going to write a number of other letters. In almost all of them, he addresses this issue of people who come into God's church and introduce either doctrine or practice that will divide the body, divide people one from another. And that's where this warning is rooted. Look at verse 17. I appeal to you, brothers, to watch out. That is, be vigilant, be on the lookout. And then the second command that we will come to is avoid these certain people. But let's talk about what we're supposed to be watchful for. First of all, watchful for the destructive work of false teachers. What are they up to? Well, again, look at, look at the Bible. Look at the words in front of us. They cause divisions. They're creating dissension. You think of what a precious gift the unity of the Spirit is. That's why Paul wrote to the Ephesians, make every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. 
We wouldn't have to make an effort if it were easy to maintain unity. We wouldn't have to make every effort or be watchful, as Paul is describing here, if there weren't outside threats. Unity is the thing that Jesus prayed for in John 17. In verse 21, we read his words, Father, that they may all be one, just as you are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. You see, the unity of the body of Christ is part of the the authoritative presence of the church in the world. People are supposed to look at our church as they were looking at the church at Rome. And remember, last week, again, those greetings are a reminder to us that it's both Jew and Gentile. It's both slave and free. It's both men and women. Such a beautiful variety that emerges in the church. And the only explanation for such diversity coming together is that Christ is at the center. That's why the adversary wants to tear at that unity. And so here are those who enter the church seeking to cause division. If you look at some of the New Testament examples of things that were dividing the church, you can find a variety of issues. At Corinth, it was actually a division over personalities. There was jealousy and even strife in that particular church over apostles. You had the Peter Club, the Paul Club, the Apollos Club, and you even had the Christ Club. You know what? God doesn't want his church to turn even gifts of apostles, as those three were, into mascots. And he certainly will not let us turn him, as our Lord and Savior, into our party mascot. It was an ugly division that ensued there. At Galatia, you had some who were showing up and saying, yeah, Jesus has done a great thing, but you need to add some Old Testament ritual law to it, specifically circumcision. And so it was Jesus plus something. Well, and that's actually what opens the door or leads to the second thing that that Paul cautions against and says you need to be on the watch for these people because they not only cause divisions, but they create obstacles that lead to ruin. The term that Paul uses here, we actually encountered back in chapter 14. There's a little different context, but it's it's a Greek term that we get our English word scandal from. And to scandalize somebody would mean to offend their senses. But, it, but what Paul is doing here is using a term that created a visual image of a stumbling block. It's an obstacle that actually causes you to fall on your face. Not just something that is difficult to go around or inconvenient, but actually leads to the ruin of individuals. These obstacles, look at the text again, while they're not named specifically, there's enough given where we know the nature of these obstacles. They're contrary to the doctrine that you have been taught, Paul says. Obstacles, stumbling blocks that are contrary to the gospel. And think of what Paul has taught us as we've worked our way through this letter, some of the powerful truth that all are guilty before God. There's not one righteous person Not one person who can stand before God and say, I did it perfectly, accept me into heaven now. Give me the gift of eternal life. Forgive my sins because of all of my good deeds. No, God requires a perfect righteousness that we could never never achieve in our own effort. But the beauty of the gospel is that he has also provided a righteousness which which we receive by faith. A perfect righteousness. We may never be justified by works of the law, but we can be justified by faith in Christ. And being justified by faith, Paul had told us back in chapter uh, 5 that we have peace with God. And then he goes on in the next chapters to describe the, the transformed life, and it culminates with that promise that there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ, and there's no separation from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. This is just some of the powerful doctrine that Paul has been laying down and that the Romans have believed. But there are those who would show up in that church as they've been showing up in places like Galatia and Corinth. And if you read through the New Testament letters, there's not one church that is an exception to this. Some who would come in and say, well, you've heard part of the truth, but there's more. 
Paul has a severe warning in the book of Galatians that runs parallel to what we're seeing here in Romans. He actually says to them, I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to, listen to this, distort the gospel of God. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. Let him be damned. That's the strength of what Paul is saying. And if they didn't get it that first time, he says, as we've said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. These are strong words of warning and admonition because there's a lot at stake. And if somebody begins to add something to the gospel saying, yes, we know Jesus lived and died and and rose again, but you need to add your works to it. Or there's some secret knowledge that nobody else has known about before, but we know now, or our little group knows, or, you know, there's some spiritual guru over here. And if you read his book, or if you listen to her teaching, then, then you'll be part of that true knowledge. And it's damnable because it's destructive to individuals like you and me. Jesus plus anything else is a distortion of the gospel. And Jesus minus anything that we have been taught or that's been revealed in the scriptures is also a distortion. So while we don't know what Paul was anticipating might be introduced at Rome, he's saying you've got to be watchful. You've got to be vigilant, paying attention to those who enter The danger is not just the destruction of the unity of the church, but also the overthrow of an individual's faith in Jesus Christ. Look at verse 18. Not only are we called to be watchful for the destructive work of false teachers, but we are called to be alert to the true nature of the false teachers. He describes what's really going on inside of them. And notice, first of all, they serve their appetites. They don't serve our Lord, he says, but their own appetites, literally their bellies. It's fairly graphic when you think about it. You recall the old movie, Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory? The old version. There's a, there's a particular scene in there that came to mind as I was meditating on this, and as Mr. Wonka leads his guests through the factory and explains, you know, all these marvels and wonders, there's a piece of gum that he has invented. Some of you will remember this, and it's an entire three-course meal in one piece of gum, and he explains that that piece of gum uh, that, that is before them at this, at this moment um, actually is tomato tomato soup, roast beef, and blueberry pie. And one of the bratty little guests who's come along, Violet, remember, she begins to eat it. And he warns her, like, it's not fully developed yet, but as she chomps it, you remember what happens, don't you? She begins to turn blue and begins to just, like, swell. And, of course, her mom is alarmed and disturbed, and everybody's a little taken back by this. And as Violet you know, continues to chew that gum and ignore the cautions and warnings of Mr. Wonka. They eventually have to haul her out and the Oompa Loompas are gonna, are gonna juice her. Like, that's the remedy. And we all say, like, what was, what was involved there? But, I mean, she just becomes a massive blueberry, as it were. Because she was not willing to say no to that appetite for this gum it ultimately led to a, a, what's really, I mean, we, we laugh at it, but I mean, it's quite alarming. Again, we all know that humanly speaking, like, that would kill us. Nobody could swell to that size. Well, there's actually a, a pretty graphic image that Paul is creating here, that these are people driven by appetites, and not just for a particular kind of food, There is a sense, as one author writes, that in serving self, not Christ, they are actually slaves of their own egos. It's ironic, isn't it? 
They would enter a church seeking to create division. They're, and it's obvious part of it, too, is that they're trying to create their own following. They want people to admire them. They want people to buy into whatever they're, they're teaching and believe their way. And, and maybe they, they said, you know, some false teachers in the New Testament uh, were actually making quite a bit of money doing it. And you can turn on the TV and see examples of this almost any time of day. But these are people who, at the end of the day, are driven by their appetites. It's not about serving Jesus. They not only serve their appetites, but Paul also says they deceive the naive. They deceive the naive. How do they do it? Look at the text again by smooth talk. Oh, they, their speeches and talks are well prepared. It just rolls right out of them. It sounds good and flattery. These people make us feel good while they're deceiving. And they deceive the hearts of the naive. When Paul speaks of the naive, he's talking about those who are actually without discernment. Sometimes we're naive because we haven't had life experience. We haven't had opportunity to learn, to grow, to be trained, to develop that discernment. No wonder Paul would say, avoid them. No false teacher walks into a church with a badge on saying, hi, I'm here to deceive you and divide you one from another and lead you astray. Then you wouldn't need discernment, would you? Paul is warning us. There's a lot at stake. And he's going to offer some things here to us that will fuel our hope and expectation. But I, I want to pause for a moment and ask you are, you, are you pursuing wisdom in the way that God desires you to? Because that's exactly where Paul goes in verse 19. And we are called to be wise in respect to what is good. Now look at verse 19. For your obedience is known to all so that I rejoice over you. And I think what he is actually getting at is they need to persist in the obedience of faith. And if you go back to uh, chapter 1, verse 5, and, and that's a long time ago in our study, but Paul writes these words, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all nations. And we're not there yet, but in verse 26, your Bibles are open, so you can go and look at chapter 16, verse 26. You'll see Paul writing again of the gospel, having been made known to all nations according to the command of the eternal God to bring about the obedience of faith. That's the obedience that I think Paul is talking about. He's not talking about obedience and like some specific requirements or, or, you know, like house rules, as it were. He's talking about you remain obedient to the faith. Don't let anybody deceive you to say there's more that nobody's ever told you before or there's less than. Because whether by addition or subtraction, the gospel, the gospel can be distorted in a way that would lead to our personal ruin. And so we're called to develop wisdom while at the same time maintaining innocence. Look at the next phrase. I want you to be wise as to what is good and innocent as to what is evil. Wisdom is the accumulated knowledge, in particular, of God's truth and discernment as to how it ought to be used. And the innocence that he speaks of here is free of guilt, free from sin. I think that's one of the things that troubles us about some of the present day educational agenda that all of us are, or at least should be alarmed that little children would be given knowledge about their sexuality at an age where they don't need that knowledge. And it's sure not the place of some of the people who are stepping into that place to say, let us tell you about it. Christian parents and grandparents, we, we need to be discipling our children in God's wisdom concerning their sexuality. The present day culture is so full of itself that it pretty much thinks that whatever, whatever enough of us agree to will become 
you know, the new truth. True wisdom, like truth itself, comes from God. And we need to be people who are continually pursuing it. It's interesting that the first temptation that Satan brought to Adam and Eve ran along similar lines of what's good and what's right. And remember, if you read through Genesis 1, you you see repeated multiple times, and God said, and it was so, and God saw that it was good. And his summary statement at the end of Genesis 1 is, it's very good. Well, well, guess what Satan attacks? Those very points, doesn't he? First question he asks, did God say? We've just read a chapter where everything that God speaks comes into existence spectacularly, gloriously, and it's all good. And then the second point that Satan makes in that temptation is to deny the reality of God's good truth his good word. You will not surely die. (laughs) How stupid can you people be? It's the age-old tactic of the devil. And then the third point of attack is questioning God's goodness, as if God's withholding something from Adam and Eve. And what does he say to them? God, what God knows that he's not telling you is that the day you eat that fruit that he's put off limits, you'll know good and evil like he does. You will become a God. And that's exactly where our culture is today. We, we think we're our own gods. And nothing could be further from the truth. Playbook is really simple when it comes right down to it, but uh, our, our adversary is very crafty. And as I heard one pastor say one time, Don't put question marks where God has put periods and exclamation points. And that's exactly what the devil did. Did God say? Can you really trust him? Is his way really good? Is his view of sexuality true? Paul says, I want you to be wise as to what is true good. And he's not talking about being naive with respect to evil. He's talking about, I want you to be free of guilt or sin. So a warning to be watchful. Stakes are high. Big point number two. Look at verse 20. There's a blessing to be received. I appreciate what Matt said earlier about the, the end of the story Uh, It has been determined. We just haven't lived through all of the chapters yet. And I thought that was interesting because I knew knew what picture was coming up on the graphic. And and I'm so thankful that Paul, in a sense, takes us all the way to the end to remind us, hey, so there's a struggle right now. And and I just warned you about a real threat. But don't don't lose heart. Don't start cowering in the corner like, oh, the bad guys are going to come get us. No, they're not. We got to be watchful. God's power has been abundantly provided. We'll get to that in just a moment. But even before that, look at verse 20. There's a promise of future conquest, and this is spectacular. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. What a contrast our God is to the false teachers of the previous verses, just starting at that at that temporal level, that superficial level, if you will. Here, God is the one who establishes peace. The false teachers are trying to stir it up and create division and lay down obstacles and stumbling blocks to even ruin your faith. That's not God's purpose at all. He's working for our peace. But notice, and this is what one author described as a bit of a paradox, God accomplishes that peace by his own violence. Look at who he places in his crosshairs. Satan, the ancient adversary himself, the one who tempts believers and slanders God. 
who accuses us before God the Father night and day, as Revelation 12, verse 10 says. He's known as the destroyer, the adversary, the prince of the power of the air, and Belial. I kind of like that name, Belial. Do you know what it means? The worthless one, because that's what he is. That's not you and me being arrogant in rebuking him or blaspheming him. Jude actually warns us about that and talks about the foolishness of, 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 of finite humans like us being so arrogant um, as to rebuke these demonic forces and Satan being one of them, but our God can, and he does and will. God will crush Satan. Oh, I love that term. That means utterly defeat him, to break into small pieces. And you know, this was first prophesied all the way back in Genesis 3. And if you were to look at verse 15, you would realize very quickly that God is actually speaking directly to Satan, and he lets Adam and Eve overhear the conversation, as it were. And then hundreds of years, thousands of years later, would inspire Moses to record the testimony of what God said to, the, to Satan. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. And, and the promise that the, that the seed of the woman, the offspring of the woman, would bruise Satan's head uses terminology of absolute destruction and crushing. I don't know that Paul, we could say that Paul is quoting Genesis 3, but I believe he's at least making a, a clear reference to the promise from long ago. Then we come into the New Testament and, and read passages such as Colossians 2.15 that tell us Jesus Christ disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in the cross. Hebrews 2.14, through his death, Christ destroyed the one who has the power of death, that is the devil. And then we read all the way to the end, and this event has not yet unfolded, but it is as sure uh, to happen as if it already had happened. In Revelation 20, verse 10, we read of a day of judgment that is coming where the devil who had deceived the nations of the earth was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet were and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. What a promise this is that the greatest adversary humanity has ever faced will be crushed ultimately, finally, permanently by the God of peace. But did you notice that little phrase, under your feet? And this sweetens it and makes it all the greater. Do you know there's a, a, a passage in the Old Testament when Joshua led the children of Israel into the promised land. Uh, there was quite a military uh, movement underway and God was behind it. And there's a particular story in, in Joshua 10, verse 24, that concludes by saying that some of the enemy kings who had actually holed up in a cave, they knew they were beaten, they were simply trying to survive the day, but Joshua and the army find them, haul them out, and Joshua, the scriptures tell us, summoned all the men of Israel and said to the chiefs of the men of war who had gone with him, come near and put your feet on the necks of these kings. Then they came near and put their feet on their necks, and Joshua said to them, do not be afraid or dismayed, be strong and courageous, for thus the Lord will do to all your enemies against whom you fight. And that physical act of placing their feet upon the necks of these enemy kings was a clear sign of their absolute supremacy and absolute victory. Kings who before had held great influence and power, kings who had ruled according to their own will, are brought to this place of utter defeat, of shame, of impotence. And here before us in Romans 16 lies one of the great promises in all the scriptures that tells us about the consummation of our salvation. 
Some of you on this day feel absolutely bullied and bloodied and battered by the adversary. And you wonder, will I ever reach a place where I will find victory over the temptations that roll my way? Will I ever be free from the guilt of my past? Will I ever be free from the shame that I experience when I, when I sin? And here is part of the answer. Satan is not greater than the God of peace. His strategies and temptations, the warfare that he wages on the church of Jesus Christ at this particular moment, it's severe, but it is not greater than God himself. And this ancient dragon who has bloodied and bullied God's people for millennia will look at the little word back in Romans 16, soon be crushed. Soon, broken into a thousand pieces. Soon, totally decimated that the very ones who've long felt that his power was greater than theirs may be even greater than Christ, which we know it is not. Will place their feet upon the neck. I hate snakes. Those of you who enjoy them and keep them, I look forward to your sanctification. <laughs> I think I've told you this story before, but not long before we moved from South Carolina, I went out into our garage, and in the back corner of the garage was a little utility room, and I kept, you know, some tools and things in there, and I opened the door uh, to get something out, and as I opened, and this, I'll never forget, this right foot was about to go down, there was a copperhead coiled up. Now it was a smaller one, but I don't care, small, large, they're all evil. <laughs> and I jumped back, I'm still not exactly, sh I didn't step on it, but I jumped back, and I was wearing Crocs, and one of the Crocs was lying, you know, left on the, on the concrete right next to that snake. And my heart, you know, just jumped to about 500 beats per minute. And I'm just shaking from head to toe. And um, I'm thinking, that snake is going to die. The question is, what am I going to kill it with? <laughs> I grabbed an axe. And I, it took me two whacks. The first one I, I kind of missed took a, there's a divot in the concrete to this day. I mean, I just struck with all my might. The second blow did not miss. And I severed the head of that thing. <laughs> and I delight to tell you that story to this day. <laughs> Beloved, we will have great joy to crush with our God. The great rival, the great adversary, the one who's worked such great woe in some of our households. Soon. The story isn't finished. We're living through it. But on the other hand, God's already written the end. And that leads us to this last little phrase, how beautiful it is that there's a sweet prayer of blessing. This is God's blessing over you. God's blessing of present grace. Because we're still waging war. We're still under attack on a daily basis. There may be false teachers who walk through our doors in the coming week and suddenly gospel hope is struggling to, to, to maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. And we're saying, where do these divisions, where are they coming from? And where do these obstacles come from? So we're not naive to the reality of life, but beloved, a great end is coming. And what sustains us to the end the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that is with us. One author writes, Paul's prayer wish that the grace of our Lord Jesus be with you 
actually finds a parallel in every other letter he wrote. And it also takes us back to the beginning of this letter. Go back to Romans 1 with me. These are like bookends. And not just for Paul's letter, but God's grace become the bookends for life itself. In Romans 1 verse 7, to all those in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And here, and we're almost at the end of his letter, but he comes back to that same theme, the necessity of people like us in this moment, waiting for the end to come, waiting for the crushing of this great adversary, waiting for the return of Christ, looking with, with eyes and ears, straining. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all, and it is. From beginning to end, life is a gift of God's grace, and from beginning to end, salvation itself is all of grace. So with faith in this unfailing promise of God that he will soon crush Satan, that we will be privileged to place our feet upon his neck, as it were, with faith that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ will keep us to the end, we live one more day. And we worship, and we serve, and we roll up our sleeves on a week like this and say, how can I help with vacation Bible time? We keep our ear to the ground, alert to the needs around us, say, I think so-and-so was kind of discouraged today. I'm going to try to follow up later this week, and maybe we could you know, share a meal or just have a little conversation together. I think that person needs some TLC. With faith and the promises of God, we press forward in sharing the gospel, though we say, who's responding? When's the great awakening going to come? You know, all kinds of things that to our eyes and ears right now make it seem like we're not on the winning side, but God says, oh, you are. Because I am who I am and I will do all that I have promised. I alluded earlier to Martin Luther's great hymn. Probably we should have chosen this, Andrew, but I didn't think about it in time to throw it in the order of service. But I love the second stanza and, well, I love the whole thing, but let me just jump in here. Did we in our own strength confide? Our striving would be losing. We're not the right man on our side, the man of God's own choosing. You ask who that may be? Christ Jesus, it is he. Lord Sabaoth, that is Lord of heavenly armies, is his name. From age to age the same, and he must win the battle. And though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, we will not fear, for God has willed his truth to triumph through us. The prince of darkness, grim, we tremble not for him. His rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure. One little word shall fell him. That word, above all earthly powers, no thanks to them, abideth. The spirit and the gifts are ours through him who with us sideth. Let goods and kindred go, this mortal life also. The body they may kill, God's truth abideth still. His kingdom is forever.